Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. Well, we're only two weeks into the year and there's already been a series of global events unfold that have stirred emotions and had everyone hanging off the world news services for the next dramatic chapter. Australia has endured one of the worst bushfire seasons on record with an unfathomable amount of bushland burned and animals destroyed. An Iranian general has been executed, potentially sparking a new Middle Eastern crisis, and the seemingly omnipresent US-China trade war has marched onwards. As a means to address our thoughts on these events we, and discuss their impacts on world markets, we have entitled this week's instalment, Christmas Crises, Missile Strikes, Bushfires and Trade Deals. I'm joined today by our Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. G'day, David. G'day, Tim. Happy New Year to you. And you. Good to be back and to the listeners. And also our Head of Investments, Damien Classen. G'day again, Damien. Hi, Tim. Fantastic. So what we'll do is we'll jump straight into the agenda today. So we're going to start by looking at the Australian bushfires, moving into uh, Iran missiles and uh, potentially World War Three. We're then going to be looking at the US-China trade deal, uh, some Chinese influence in Hong Kong and Taiwan, and then of course rounding out, as always, looking at how these themes impact the investments and the models we run every day here at Nucleus Wealth and the MB Fund. So with no further ado, let's jump into it. Who'd like to begin? Australian bushfires. Oh, I'll go have a crack, I guess. Um, so Aussie bushfires, um, uh, maybe you want to do that one, actually. Damo, well, because I, I, I didn't write GDP effect versus economic yeah, effect. Yeah, I think, I think the main thing is, um, so there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of discussion out there about, you know, is this a positive, a net positive economic thing because, because of the rebuild? And so there's this issue with um, with a rebuild in terms of saying, well, uh, you know, what we call a broken window fallacy. If you break a window and then you fix it, that's great for GDP. But you're saying, well, it's not actually good economically. Like somebody's mm. just gone and had to had to go and spend money and effort and 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 bring someone in to fix something that that wasn't actually, you know, the, the net effect before versus after is still I have a window. Just replacements. Yeah. Yep. And so um, it's Australia's favourite growth trick. That one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that in population. Oh, and, yeah. Well, yeah. oh, no, it's that, that is what it is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you add more people and then, you know, try and catch up to where you were in terms of standards of living. Anyway, go mm. on. Yeah, and, and then you have, and, that, and China's got a similar thing where, you know, they, they keep knocking down apartments to build new ones and you're saying, well, if somebody had an apartment to live in enough before and afterwards, yeah, it's slightly newer, but, you know, the actual economic effect on the economy and that are, are you progressing forward so um so the, the gdp effect though even even the effect we think will come through from from having to rebuild is isn't as much as all the negatives which we'll sort of get onto on, on the next some of the some of the next points i guess probably start with inflation so um there's uh food price inflation is is certainly to come through um there's uh we've also had s- so, th- sorry, this is a supply problem due to farmland burning and... and yeah, yep, yep. And, and animals yep. um, cold and, and yep. okay. things like that and, and supply chains interrupted. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so inflation in, in food prices is, is pretty certain to come through. Uh, there might be a bit of inflation in um, uh, in other areas of the economy that are sort of... Um, you know, Being squeezed. fixed. Yep. Yep. Uh, and what we're thinking, though, is that the RBA will very much, very much look through those... Having said that, though, even if the RBA does look through it, um, there's, or, or, or say they're going to look through it, there will be an element of um, will they do as much as what they what they should have done. So, for example, if if there was no bushfires and, and we're sitting on um, you know one point five one point six percent inflation, which is well below their their, their target, um, that's sort of saying to the RBA they have to get out there and do more. Uh, if we're sitting on sort of two and a half percent inflation, sort of de- dead in the middle of their target. Mm. Um, they won't be raising rates because they'll be saying, well, we have to look through this inflation because uh, it's coming from the bushfires, but will they actually keep out, go out and spend more or, or go out and do other quantitative easing or, or whatever it is that they, they might not... Um, you know. So, so it'll, they'll look through it to justify not turning, not turning the ship around and starting to raise rates, yep. but will they, look, will they look through it enough to actually um, stimulate. S- stimulate more? Yep. We suspect not. Yeah, given, given, their, given their past track record. Yes, oh, David. well, I'll disagree with you. I think they will. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's about the jobs market rather than inflation. Mm. I mean, it, all indications are that unemployment's set to keep rising, uh, particularly owing to the um, building bust. Yep. Uh, and we'll get to 
whether we think that the fires will have any impact in, on that in a moment. Well, I should say now, I guess, 2,000 new homes or 2,000 homes lost, mm. potentially replaced. It's very small. It's not likely to be material for um, any rebound in building. Mm. Um, yeah. and, and, local, and, local, in local areas, it'll be it'll be big for some yeah, of those areas. Sure, sure. But, but not in yeah, aggregate. As a, in aggregate, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, the other sort of $3 billion or so earmarked for... Uh, you know things like um, securing the power grid and what have you. Mm. That'll take time to roll out as well. And in the meantime, you know there's a there's a major engineering construction bust underway. Mm. Um, you know the infrastructure pipeline uh, is still very big, but it's falling. It's mm. not it's not even stable. It's actually falling away. Mm. So and you know there's no um, immediate turn coming in in dwelling construction either. So I mean we think that the unemployment rate will continue to tick up uh, well i do and um i think that that will trigger the rba it it, mm. it may not be in february you know <laughs> they might take pause for a month or two yeah but okay. but I, I still think that um uh, if unemployment continues to t- to tick higher they'll they'll they'll, they'll cut again yeah I'm, I'm not arguing they won't cut i guess what i'm arguing is oh, look i think they will cut twice i said i haven't changed my our views on that and they'll start some QE later on in the year. Yeah. I'm just saying it. I don't think it'll be as big as it could have been if if we didn't have the the, the bushfires come through. Yeah, possibly. So, mm. Yeah. So I, a, I guess I, I don't see it altering the the trend and where they're going. No, it, it may play around with the timing no. a little. And it, exactly. And, and I guess what I'm saying is it probably should. It probably should. It probably should mean they they should actually go earlier and go harder. I, yeah, probably. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I, I think that as well. What will hopefully become clear through this discussion, that I think, I think the net outcome of the fires is negative. Yes, not, absolutely. Not positive. On the economy or on markets? Uh, on the economy. Okay. Yeah. And GDP um, and markets. Yeah. So the building boom, I guess we've more or less covered that. There isn't really much of one coming in terms of uh, reparations. Mm. Um, so... You know, and it's it's really fighting against this immense downdraft in dwelling construction that's got most of this year to run, if not into next year. Mm-hmm. Even if we see a turn in in um, buy in sales now, that won't won't be able to turn the um, trend in growth. Yeah. Up. Well, well, I mean, mo- for most of this anyway. If you decide tomorrow, here's my if we get an insurance check tomorrow, which probably won't take tomorrow probably be yeah. more like a, a month or two mm. and say right you know get my let's get my builder and start planning and doing all those things you know you're still talking a month or two three four months before you're breaking ground yeah a lot of these and then meanwhile you know there's starting to get a, you know a bit of um kind of anecdotal evidence that tourism has taken a pretty nasty hit so far the evidence suggests that it's more domestic tourism than it is international yep which Probably an aggregate, aggregate isn't negative either, I would have thought. Like, locals sort of cancel going to the bush. Yeah, well, because it's a fire, do. they might go somewhere else or yeah. they might spend that money or maybe they put it on the mortgage. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I would have thought that they would just shift their holiday plans rather than necessarily not go. Mm-hmm. And p- p- potentially um, foreign tourists would just p- p- would do the same, perhaps? Um, well, the anecdotal evidence so far is, is that bookings for international haven't fallen much okay um but i guess that you know if you're booked if you booked an international holiday it's a big call to cancel that mm. it's a lot of money mm. um i would have thought in the medium term it's more an issue yep. like just where you're contemplating going to australia for a holiday maybe in six months or yep. 12 and then you've seen all of this and there was immense sort of negative global coverage it was yeah uh it's made us all the way to the, to the ufc yeah and you're planning on coming to australia next summer yeah uh, and you might think well mm. i'll hang back or go somewhere else do i really want to go and you know smoke two packs a day in sydney <laughs> <laughs> or etc so well beijing so i think that's probably the major concern mm. um in terms of impact um and then the you know there's also Consumer confidence, um, you know, the initial... With these kind of shocks, generally, you you see, you know, kind of stick a shock with confidence drops markedly, in there, but then bounces back really quick. Um, on this one, I don't know. I, I think there could be more of a lingering effect, mm-hmm. um, simply because 
the government has handled it so badly. Yep. Um, and there's there's a real kind of tipping point feel to the whole thing um, for the Morrison government. Um, they've they really they really botched it, and they still are. There's no real sense that they're getting on the front foot mm. to address climate change or, for that matter, adaptation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, they're flopping around with everyone putting in their two bobs worth. There's no real leadership. Um, so I think there might be a more lingering impact on consumer confidence, especially since we're already so households were already so grim and so stalled. Mm. Um, I don't think this will do them any good. So, uh, you know, international tourism and, and uh, household spending or household consumption are probably likely to have a lingering negative. Yep. Another reason why I think the RBA probably should go harder mm. um, and, and likely won't. <laughs> um, uh, and then, mm. you know, you've got the ongoing drought, mm. of course, which has been sucking slowly at at GDP um, and is also I think starting to have a, a pretty um, beyond the fires starting to have a pretty negative impact especially in New South Wales around crises around water mm, absolutely uh, towns running out of water and, yeah yeah yep and Sydney Sydney's water supply is down to like 43 yep. percent I think and if that persists till mid-year you know we'll be getting down into the 30s pretty mm. quick and uh you know, the whole thing sort of starts to feel a bit end of days. Yep. Um, fires into drought, into water shortage. You know, I, I think that's not going to help uh, the consumer bounce out of its existing funk. Mm. Um, I mean, another kind of interesting angle is will it do anything to house prices? Um, I mean, a bit of an unknown. I, w- I wouldn't have thought so necessarily. But again, if the consumer gets more grim, uh, then probably a little bit. Yeah, I saw something the other day, um, uh, fairly, it was given by a real estate agent saying that um, in the localised areas where fires generally are, you get a big push up in prices due to the fact that you get insurance policy payouts and people want to live around it. Now, it's so localised and so small, I think it would barely move the needle on a national and, level. And but the, other no. thing, the other thing I'd say in that is um, it goes from, you know, I have a... Uh, 1950s Fibro Shack just burnt down yep. and got a brand spanking new McMansion. Yep. So the land value hasn't changed at all. It possibly has gone down a little bit because of the bushfire. Yep. But the value of the house sitting on there is worth a lot more now. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, immigration would it have an impact, do you think? Or I mean, Imagine. Yeah. Might. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, Immigration now from the subcontinent and pollution may not necessarily be an issue, yeah, especially and also for Chinese, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, I mean, they, at least in the case of the Chinese, you know, the the kind of bolt hole down under in a clean environment has been for a, now. a, fa- a yeah. fairly central kind of incentive. Mm-hmm. So maybe on that front, it could be a bit, bit of damage. Um, I don't know if the same thing holds for the Indian community, which tends to be a bit further down the socio-economic ladder, I think, than the Chinese migrants. Mm. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of... A uh, little bit of damage in each one of those, probably, um, and a little more lingering than usual, I would I would think. Mm. But, I mean, it's very speculative. And remembering as well... We're really we, just we're guessing. Not, we're, only, we're only sort of halfway through or three-quarters of the way through the actual Australian fire season with um, Victoria known for February being the, the hot month. Yeah, so. well, at least we've had some rain. Mm. Um, well, one day anyway. One, one day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take what we can get a little bit point. of rain. <laughs> yeah. Very good. All right, well, we'll jump across to the next topic. But just before I do, I'll just let, obviously, our people, anyone listening in know that the uh, the chat box is open for live questions along the way. We are shooting this live. And also, for those listening in, we will be providing the slides in the uh, in the link in the show notes on the, on the podcast. So we'll jump across now to the Iran missiles and, uh, and World War III. World War III getting bandied around a little bit recently on social media. Uh, yeah. Where would you like to begin? That's drawing a very long bow, World War Three. <laughs> well, a very, right. very long bow. But, but you know, we thought we'd put it up there for, because as you said, there's a bunch of people saying that you know, that they think uh, China and Russia are all ready to go to step in behind Iran to, yeah. and maybe they are, but I think it seems uh, it seems unlikely. Yeah, I've I mean, uh, what have we got there? Limited impact on oil. 
neither side wants war. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> he tr- probably, probably Trump would love to bomb Iran, but anyway, he can't because he promised not to do any wars. Yeah. Um, and uh, if anything, it's looking like they like they're uh, more likely to actually withdraw troops from Iraq uh, on the back of this rather than be going further in. Mm. Uh, and as a Jacksonian president. Uh, he simply doesn't start wars unless unless it's World War Three. Yep, interesting. Um, uh, it's not, you know, his 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 base, if you like, is uh, not up for it. Um, complicated by plane shot down. Yeah, I mean yeah. those things wash out. Yeah. So the only the only thing I'm keeping an eye on, but I think you should be watching is just those if those protests get any bigger and start to spread to other areas of the country i don't think they will but mm. but if they if they do it's they certainly it's it's quite possible they, they will is that then you start saying well does then iran need to crack down and and other things you know you, you start spiraling back in, in a different direction yep but i think there was sort of a there was initially a lot of um you know given the death of the general there was a, i think there was initially a big outpouring towards and uh, the iranian Regime, which was having actually having a few problems with, yeah, with um, absolutely ongoing protests, ongoing protests. Yep, and then um, then it comes out, hey, we shot a passenger plane out of the sky and killed all these people, innocent people, and then the protests are sort of flared up again. So they mm. sort of gone from potentially this being a a positive for the regime in in a way. Yep, um, to uh, to back to where they they started from. Yep, uh, yep. I so mean, probably probably in, in terms of markets, the most important thing was was how little impact it had on oil. Mm. And it's continued to fall since. Yep. I mean, WTI is back in the 50s and falling. Uh, and, you know, that story is unchanged. Like, mm. the, despite the US rig count coming off um, pretty substantially over the last 12 months because the oil price had been wallowing, you know, around 50, 55, uh, it, US production just can, continues to boom. Mm. Yep. Uh like the the shalers have been tapping this enormous inventory of untapped wells, and um, productivity has been booming in the wells as well. Yep. Uh, and so I think they passed 13 million barrels per day yesterday or something. It was um, out with the EIA, mm. uh, and and so you know there's just a uh, an intractable oil glut. Mm. And so, uh, and so OPEC's in a way this got, keeps got so nearly what four million barrels per day off offline. Mm-hmm. And so, in a way, when you when you're keeping, um, you know, if the oil price is whatever three, four, five dollars higher than it would have otherwise been, um, because of sort of Iranian tensions, that just means more oil gets pumped because, uh, you know, yeah, nice amount. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the the drillers in the US are more than happy to to take it and sell it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we sort of. But if oil is so well supplied that it can survive this kind of ruction. Mm. Uh, then the inflation outlook for the globe is is weak. Mm. Okay. Yep. Um, so that that buys into uh, you know ongoing bond market bid. I, I saw um, once again reading probably too much press over the holidays, but there was a, a, some US shalers starting to throw their hands up in the air, saying that they're going to go bang. And I know we've spoken about this many times in the past in some of our more oil centric mm. podcasts, but. From memory, so when you say go bang, uh, so I was in as, at the current, current current oil, um, current oil price. They're basically forward estimates is negative. They're they you know, they're not going to make any money. Yep. Um, and from memory, that sparks perhaps uh, some some problems in the bond market, corporate U.S. bond market. Yeah, are we seeing a bit of a tipping point there? Is as the oil price no, some no, burn, no. burnout show? Yeah, because no? because the prices have, have risen since. Okay. So it's an issue if, if prices go lower. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah. they really have to get in deeper into the forties. Okay. to cause yeah. any kind of junk bond problem in the US. And in fact, the junk, junk bond market's been rallying right. in the okay. US and, and emerging markets globally. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. We'll jump across to the US-China trade deal. So we've had a little bit of uh, very recent news, potentially positive, but um, prior to that, over Christmas, yeah. it was quiet. Well, if you have a look at, at this tile that we've got here, this is pretty much the deal as we know it. Yeah. Like three lines. <laughs> <laughs> um it's pretty much a blank piece of paper. We're not sure what's in it. Um, it seems very vague. China doesn't want to release any details. Uh, you know, there are some some folks that are putting a very positive spin on it, people who, whose view I think is worth listening to. Um, Steve Bannon, Cole Bass, etc. Uh, 
and I mean it really depends how you frame the question whether or not the deal is useful um, it doesn't appear economically useful in in the short term um, it's certainly been useful to markets and sentiment uh, I think it's somewhat useful in terms of Cold War 2.0 like in terms of the US making progress on that front, it's somewhat useful. Uh, but that's not really the deal, so much as the fact that they confronted them in the first place. Um, so other than markets and obviously the huge bounce that we've seen, sentiment driven, um, don't see it having much economic impact. Mm. Um, a little bit at the margin for the US with the increased e e um, exports to China. Yep. Don't see it changing the Chinese ec um, external account at all. Yeah. At all, currency no. movements. And no, mo and most of the things they're buying are, are tradable goods. So whether it's oil or, or gas or whatever it is, where it doesn't really matter. They're trying to buy from um, trying to buy from the US rather than buying from you know somewhere in the Middle East, and the, yep. the stuff in the Middle East will end up going to Europe rather than going to and, yeah. You know, okay. It's just sort of so that's right. Around. Some yeah. some have been. Speculating that Australia will take a hit on LNG, yeah, okay. and that might impact the dollar. Don't really buy that for that reason. It's just fungible. I mean, the LNG will still go out, mm. and it'll just go somewhere else. Yep. Um, it it won't be price. It will be probably be price negative, um, in so far as it might draw out some more um, U.S. gas that wasn't necessarily viable. Mm -hmm. um, and then the displaced gas will go somewhere else, etc. So, you know, you'll get some shifts between contracts and spot markets, and yeah. and you might get you might get another export terminal or two built that wouldn't have otherwise been built. So mm. a bit more certainty under possibly under supply. Um, so, yeah. so, but net net, it's not a big deal for Australian LNG. I don't think. Um, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, there's enough fundamental problems with that. The, the, deal, is, not, yeah. the okay. deal is not a big deal. <laughs> the deal is not a big deal. Yeah. Well, the big deal is not a big deal. Well, it's sort of a, it'd be the old two steps forward, one step back. You're just waiting for the reneg at the end of the week or something, or you know, it's a bit of a wobble. Well, they've sort of yeah. both both agreed that they'll keep talking again, and uh, after the yeah. election, pretty much. Yeah. Sort of like and the a, the tech stuff has never gone away. Hmm. But it's getting worse. Yep. You know, yeah. US is still bashing Huawei and. Um, you know, bashing anyone else that wants to deal with Huawei. Mm. The UK's under a lot of pressure. They're resisting for now. but um, And Europe, you know, has been climbing into that as well, On really on the US side. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I mean, probably the longest-term impact from it is simply that the US did it at all. Yep. You know, that took them on with tariffs. And that's going to deter a lot of investment in China over time, mm -hmm. um, and and then the deal, you know, doesn't doesn't really change that. Yeah, I don't okay. think. All right, interesting. Well, stay tuned for the uh, the next iteration of the US. China yeah, the, the, the great soap opera. We'll jump across yeah. to the Chinese influence in Taiwan and Hong Kong, kicking off with Taiwan. Thoughts, gentlemen. A big win for pro-democracy, Damien. Yeah, Taiwan. yeah. So I think for me, the the interesting facts come out. The factors that come out to it is um, there's been a lot of talk of uh, what's been happening in terms of whether it's social media or or propaganda or um, you know uh, China funding of, of opposition candidates and and a whole bunch of sort of um, behind the scenes general meddling meddling that's going on yep um, <coughs> and I think the the big win the, the you know the record sort of numbers and and big pushback sort of shows you know the limit to, to propaganda and that if uh, if it's out in the sun if it's out in the sunlight um, it becomes less way less effective mm -hmm. and I think if you've also got quite educated populations um, you know that there's there's more pushback as well and so I think um, I think it's going to be a bit of a wake up for, for China in terms of uh, changing its. It has to change something. Yep. It, 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 thinks China, it thinks Taiwan should be part of its country. It's yep. been actively, actively pushing countries around the world to, to not recognize it. Mm. Um, and I think there's a. Um, I think they'll, they'll have to change what they're doing because what they're doing is obviously not working. And that's the point. That's the part where it is you know, a big unknown and, 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 a, and, a, and a risk. 
yep. in terms of what, you know, how they want to escalate it from here. Well, it's kind of working before Hong Kong, a little. Yeah. I mean, I think they just go back to thin slicing the sausage, don't they, and just... Chipping just away. Chipping away, yeah. Mm. Mm. At it, and, you know, they're not in a position... Well, there's no need for them to try and take Taiwan mm. at this point. Mm. Um, I think the danger comes as their economy slows and, you know, the Communist Party risks losing its social contract with Chinese middle classes and over the next kind of 10 years. Mm. Uh, and then it tries to stoke, you know, nationalism. Yeah, show of power, show of force or something. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, and that by then it has, say, five or six aircraft carriers or whatever. And, you know, in some some ways it's a match for the US militarily, at least in, mm. t- in terms of the South China Sea. And, you know, maybe then it makes sense in, in terms of the just the raw power calculus of staying yep. staying mm. top dog mm. um, uh, and probably similar in Hong Kong yeah you well we've got there the, the next West Bank or Gaza Strip so do yeah, you elaborate on that basically that, you know there's an interesting viewpoint it's not uh, from it's from a Chinese political uh, scholar who's basically sort of saying well that's it's probably a good thing if, if that's if it's a bunch ends up being a bunch of Hong Kong kids throwing rocks at police and yep. and and tanks and stuff like that and there's sort of this low level unrest but that the sort of just ongoing but never actually really spreads into something bigger or never actually spreads to the rest of china yep then from china's perspective that's probably about what you know as, as good as what you can expect mm-hmm. from from hong kong okay so um they have also fired that the sort of the the key uh or the, one of the most senior uh chinese officials there the head of the liaison office and yep. appointed a new one okay. um just within the uh the start of the new year and so um, that does sort of, uh, you know, leave some scope for, for a change. Mm-hmm. And maybe Carrie Lam will, you know, there's always a potential there that, that she might step down. I think that, you know, that if you if they appointed a new head of liaison, Carrie Lam stepped down. Um, they basically didn't do any more, didn't, didn't do any more thin slicing for, for a little bit until things calmed down a bit and then commenced the, the thin slicing is probably what you'd think a, a you know, rational response would be. I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I, you could probably conclude that uh, sometime late last year, Xi Jinping realised he'd overreached. Mm. You think? Yeah. Well, pivoted on the trade deal, mm. um, and he didn't invade Hong Kong, mm. and started making some sort of noises about minor compromises. Um, and so I would expect Taiwan will, will embolden the Hong Kong protesters, you would think. Mm. Um, so I don't expect it to go away. Uh, but I, I, you know, will it come to a head in the year ahead? Uh, can't say. Probably not in the short. We've got Chinese New Year coming up in a couple of weeks as well. So I'm a bit yeah. Say, so. I mean, I, I, you know, the West Bank Gaza Strip stuff, it's not a bad analogy. I, I mean, you don't want to get caught up in the granularity of that yep um, it's not about you know the poverty that we see in some of the palestinian territories it's about um how uh a satellite um area of unrest can be managed in terms of a greater population so um yeah you i think hong kong just kind of bleeds on um, well, you probably got this thing where um, the the university student of today is the um, indentured you know employee with a mortgage of tomorrow. So if you give it five or you know eight years, then <laughs> they run out of free time to protest, and it goes moves on to the next generation's problem, perhaps. Well, don't forget the Chinese security forces are in there big time as well, and they're arresting <laughs> yeah. people left, right, and centre. So that's the sort of thin slicing argument mm. where they just slowly try and hollow out protests yep mm. um that said you know it is kind of do or die for mm. hong kong at this point so and and if you you've got to do that carefully otherwise the the rebellion just grows yep mm. um so you know a, an uncomfortable level of ongoing unrest in hong kong um emboldened by taiwan mm. okay very good yeah we'll jump across now to the investment outlook 
Let's kick off with some stock valuations. We spoke a lot about stock valuations and market valuations last week, Damien. Yeah, so. I've just popped two charts up. One uh, that we had in there last week, just sort of showing that the the forward earnings in the US versus uh, the 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 S and P index, and basically, you know, if earnings go up, then then the index goes up, is is sort of generally the rule. Uh, I think certainly over the last uh, sort of six to nine months, earnings have been going sideways, and um, the, the, the market has risen quite dramatically. Mm-hmm. Now, and sometimes in the past, that's a sign that there's all this earnings growth about to come. Um, we're still having str- we're struggling to see it. Um, the latest data we've got out now, um, I've put on the, the chart on the right, just sort of showing the, the S&P forward earnings and then the Australian forward earnings as well, and just showing, well, there's no real recovery in the S&P. The Aussie forward earnings, there's a bit of a recovery, but that's, that's off, off a low base, and that's mainly um, some of the uh, commodities, okay. on all, higher iron ore prices. Uh, but so, you know, it is still very hard to see, um, you know, buying 19 times earnings, um, mm. uh, so really paying up for, for companies at the moment, but you're really just not seeing any of that earnings growth at, at the aggregate level. At individual companies, you know, that's, it is a different story. And we've seen, parts. yeah, and as you go through some of the, some of the names in there, um, but but again, some of those ones where, you know, Apple, which is sort of one of our biggest holdings, mm. um, is up sort of 100% over the last year. <laughs> and um, it's getting to the stage where, you know, it was sort of moderately, oh, sorry, it's about, it was about average valuation, yep. uh, you know, a year ago. And now you're starting to get well and now it's starting to get pretty expensive. Yep. So even though earnings, earnings growth has been decent for it, so, but it's that type of thing you just need to keep coming back and going, well... Would I still buy it? Would I still buy it? Mm. Do I need to start taking a bit off the top and, and those types of factors? And that goes through most of the tech sector. So the places where you are seeing the growth, mm. you're getting dramatic share price performance. Yep. Um, but in, in aggregate across the entire US market, you're really not seeing any of that growth and any, any earnings growth. A mm. couple of things here. Um, so obviously uh, with the ASX hit an all-time high today, 7,000. Um, do you feel that this year might be the uh, the year of the earnings miss, perhaps? Are we are people paying paying too much, and is that is that going to be an issue going forward for for the local market? Oh, definitely. Yep. Yeah. A few and people it, come out talking and, about this. Yeah, and some of the you know talking about Apple going up, but there's some stocks in in Australia which are, you know Apple's a very high quality stock, but there's some stocks in Australia which are of similar high quality. So say a CSL, mm. which is sort of trading on fifty times earnings last bucks. year, and, yeah. and you know, forty something times this year. Yep. Um, sort of the the forecast. There are some other upsides that you know you can see where that coming through. But but um, yeah, you're really having to pay up for um, for Australian companies. Mm. And, and the thing for Australian companies as well. So Australia is not that much cheaper than the US, with way worse growth. And the other thing is where uh, Australia is very heavily weighted towards um, banks and resources, which tend to be low PE sectors. Yep, okay. So ordinarily you'd expect that Australia should trade at a big discount just because of the makeup of the companies. Yep. So you're happy to pay higher multiples for companies that are safe and high quality and secure. Um, resources and banks tend not to be um, put in, the, in that, that category. Boat. Yeah, right. And so, um, yeah, so Aust- Australian um, companies just look incredibly expensive for the for the growth that you can see and 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 the economic outlook it's still it's very hard to tie together where yeah where it's all going to come from come from yep okay yeah. very good i mean the the key i think is is bond yields like they have to um they have to remain low or they can't go on mm. that's the equity risk premium that's driving it i think so mm. um and you know the good news for those who believe in it uh, is that you know the outlook for inflation is still very weak yep both here and globally you've got u.s wages coming off only a sluggish recovery in europe china's going to keep slowing and um, australia is operating at stall speed so um you know as long as bond yields stay low there's some hope that that thing can persist mm, okay and so for us, uh, remaining underweight Australia, just as a little wrap-up of our asset yeah, allocation yeah, for absolutely. the minute. Underweight Australia, um, overweight or slightly overweight international equities, but, but net, net effect on equities is, is underweight. Because mm-hmm. I think that the, the thing is, there's no immediate, like none of the, we didn't look at any of these prices that we spoke about um, as being like an immediate catalyst for, for markets to fall. Yep. Um, we did take advantage of sort of buying some bonds as the yields sort of rose, and, mm-hmm. that's sort of, and then they've come back driven back down to the levels now where we're sort of not that keen to be to be still buying we're happy to hold but we're not not keen to be out there buying more sure uh i think there's a um 
uh, you know, the worsening fundamentals we think will, will become more obvious. Mm-hmm. And the next, um, you know, we've got reporting season coming up in the next month or so. Yep. Um, so that'll be sort of pretty pretty key. Mm. And then um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of daylight before we see the next sort of set of earnings to 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 really judge how things are going. But but um, so we're, we're probably thinking more later on in the year um, you know, as as more evidence comes of the fundamentals weakening that you'll see more weakness. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Great answer. And just finally, uh, Aussie and US dollar. Uh, obviously, floating around with six sixty nine. Was it today? Uh, yeah, roughly sixty nine. Short to medium term. Today? It's just been floating. Well, it's been floating up with the whole global reflation hope. Yep. Uh, along with the trade deal and a bit of uh, post Brexit, yep. etc., uh, you know that might have a little bit more left in it as if, as long as bond yields are low and globally, uh, um, and you know you, when when markets take it in their heads that the globe's going to recover, the U.S. dollar tends to fall. Mm-hmm. So that's a bit of upside for the Aussie dollar, mm-hmm. uh, but I think as the Australian uh, ongoing Australian malaise becomes apparent um, and the RBA is forced to act again. A mm-hmm. couple of cuts and, and QE sometime this year then, then the Aussie rolls. And I expect that that will probably coincide with uh, you know, more uh, more repairs to the supply side of the iron ore market and um, falling iron ore prices, mm. making our income woes worse. So um, I would expect the Aussie, you know, could could have a little more upside, but I'd expect it to roll sometime this year and head lower again. Mm, okay, all right, fantastic. Well, on that note, good finishing point there, and segues nicely into our uh, guests coming up next uh, next week. So we've got Dr. Stephen Hale, who is a lecturer at the School of Economics. Uh, for the University of Melbourne. Uh, we're going to be having a chat to him. He uh, specialises in uh, modern monetary theory, or some people call it magical monetary theory, and uh, uh, I think it ties in quite, quite nicely to our viewpoints for the RBA uh, for, the, for the next 12 months. So we're looking forward to that. Same bad time, same bad channel, Thursday the 23rd of January, and you can head over to the Nucleus Wealth Live webinar page and have your answers, uh, or your questions rather, answered live, and we'll see you there. Well, that's it for now and thanks for watching. If you like what you heard today and you'd like to hear more, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash subscribe, give us your email address and in return we'll send you a weekly email with new webinar topics, links for our podcasts and other news from Nucleus Wealth. I certainly hope you've got something out of today as I have and we'll look forward to catching you with the next one. Cheers.